the Mets. Lots of cracks, one of the Mets win the ball game. Out of sight. <laughs> You are now listening to the Shea and Sons Podcast with your hosts, Keith and Keyshawn Diaz. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Shea and Sons Podcast for episode number 12. Que lo que, que la que hay. What's going on, my people? What's going on, baby brother? What's going on, man? It's lots to talk about. You know what I mean? A lot happened. It's the Francisco Lindor episode. <laughs> I know there's some people that don't want to hear that. But episode 12, baby, we're here. We are here. We are here. Shout out to uh, our partners in crime at Shea Hello Media. Thank you again for sponsoring the episode. Um, another rough week in Metland, baby brother. It's been rough, man. It's it's, it's tough. We, uh, you know, we're getting into, like, really dog days. Usually they happen, like, around June, but we're able to kind of, like, of overcome the June swoon, but... I don't know, man. Hopefully, good, better, better. You know, hopefully, there's a light at the end of this tunnel because this is just rough. Um, how yeah, you holding up during rough. these rough times? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, you know I mean, I'm on this journey for a better life, but the Mets are preventing me from from getting that journey off the ground. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Thank God for this podcast, because good lord, man. Um. Listen, we're going to give you a rundown. We're going to go through. We're uh, going to cover the week like we always do. Uh, we're going to run through that. We got a trade. You know, shout out to Fogo de, you know, Fogo de Chao, Escobar de la Pica. You know what I'm saying? He was one of our favorite Mets. Unfortunately, he is no longer here. We're going to dive into that. And today, we're going to talk about the most popular name in Mets land, Mr. David Stearns. Because, you know, if you log into Mets Twitter, you're going to hear, oh, Stearns is coming, Stearns is coming. Well, who the hell is David Stearns? And we're going to talk about it today. So, baby brother, if you will, you have the leadoff Houston series. Talk to me about the Mets down in Texas, man, because it wasn't as pretty as we hoped it would be. It was not as pretty as we were hoped it would be. Let's talk about game one. All right, so the Mets won 11 1. Offense was clicking on all cylinders. Mounts had Max had a bounce back start. Shout out Max. Went eight innings. He allowed, yeah, shout out to Max. He allowed just one run on 91 pitches. He could have pitched the knife, but I get why Buck Walter didn't want to push it. Um, Lindor, Vogelback both had homers in this game. Mm-hmm. Vogelback is looking very good at the play of late as well. Um, Lindor had a five RBI day. Shout nice. out to him. I think him and Pete are. Still top five in RBIs. Yep. You know, to some people that's a sad that doesn't matter. But if you drive in runs, you probably win a lot of games. I mean, Unfortunately, we haven't gotten n- that luck. No one else is driving in runs, so shit. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, Tommy Pham is batting 373 over his last 16 games. Fambino. With four home runs. Yeah, big fan Bino. Four home runs, 18 RBIs. I think he had an RBI in this game, two hits. Um, and Brett Beatty, seven of his last 20. In the past five games. So he's been hitting the ball well as well. Um, yeah, the Mets were just hitting throughout mm-hmm. this entire game. It took advantage of a of a I think he's a rookie pitcher as well. Um, yeah, Max looked great. He looked dominant. That slider was moving. Him and Francisco Alvarez had a good rapport in this one. And the Mets came away with a with a large victory. Big, big. Uh you would think that that was gonna set the tone for the series because I didn't see eleven runs coming, but hey. And um, that rookie pitcher for Houston, Hunter Brown, you know, a lot of uh, Astro fans telling me that that could be the next Verlander. Ooh, excuse me. That could be the next Verlander. And um, the way we handle him, hey, I mean, he's a rookie pitcher. It is what it is. But the Mets, I mean, he, like you said, uh, Vogel back, man. Shout out to Vogel. Uh, not the most popular name in Mets land, depending on who you talk to. Um, hey, yeah. the mental break worked. Hey, I don't care who it is. If we're winning, whoever's on the team, I understand there's, you know, there's a lot of people who should be on the team, but they're not here. But, hey, if you're here, produce. Right. It's cool, man. We win. I'll take it. Uh, Francisco Lindor, hey, man, this is what we have him here to do. You know, it's funny. Like, he has a five RBI game, and then you don't hear anything. But if he goes one for four with three yeah. strikeouts, the world is on fire. So, you know, we all know he's the low-hanging yeah. fruit uh, for people who don't understand the game of baseball. Um, he definitely needs to improve, though. It is what it is. But nice to see him have a good day. Shout out to Max, man. I yep. criminally uh, yeah. criticized him. So to do that in Houston, big up. Um, yeah, it was a nice way to set the tone for the series. 
Definitely was. So you brought up um, Astro fans talking about their rookie pitcher as the next Verlander. And in that game, he gave up almost six runs. And he definitely looked like Verlander. So that takes us to game two, <laughs> which Christ. Verlander gave up, gave up four Christ. runs. He didn't look great <laughs> in his homecoming game. Um, Framber yeah. Vop had an amazing start. He looked fantastic. He looked like That's everything. Boy, man. I, I love Framber. Boy. Yeah, I love watching him. He put the offense to sleep. He like smothered them, and he they were out for the count. Even without the, the inning. even without the like the rocking thing, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, the shit he used to do. He still rocked them to sleep. Shout out to Framber, man. That was nasty. Yeah, yeah. He um he didn't allow a base runner for the Mets until the sixth inning, and he didn't allow a run until the eighth inning. He was lights out for them. Yeah. Um, Verlander, he had a uh, seven innings pitch usually. We like to preach, you know, the longer guys go, the more we win. There's stats to prove it, but Buck Showalter had Verlander out there just to rest the bullpen for seven innings. He gave mm-hmm. up baby hits, forearm runs. Um, as teammates last year, both of these guys combined for a 35-10 and 10 record with a 2.32 ERA. And one of, the, one of these guys looks like that, and the other one looks like a far cry from it. Um, but, yeah, the offense looked – Looked absolutely horrible for most of this. Um, they only mustered up four hits. Just wasn't a good game for the offense. Wasn't a good game for the pitching. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all knew we were in for a shitstorm with Framber on the mound. So, I mean, yeah. the frustration part for me is, like, you know, ace versus ace, I guess. You know, maybe our ace keeps us in it yeah. with the other ace, and he, he couldn't. But, yeah, the offense has to step up. But, you know, the offense, ha- the offense has been good of late. So, if they have that occasional yeah. one day where they go up against literally a top three pitcher in baseball, maybe our yeah. pitcher can keep us in the game. But, of course, he didn't. So, right. I mean, once once Framber got out the game, we kind of like, well, towards when he got tired, we kind of woke up a little bit. But by then, you know, Verlander kind of shat the bed. So, that is what it is. But we yep. go to the rubber match, right? Yep. Game three, the Mets lose. A back and forth battle. This shit was very good. This was a very good game. Tough one. They lost eight to ten. Um, Tyler McGill, you stink. There's a reason why you got your bags packed after this game immediately, the same day as your brother. So cheers to you guys. Isn't that um, ironic? Funny how that works. Yeah, that's very, that's so funny. He couldn't even finish three innings. He went uh two and one third, uh five runs, four earned, four walks. He just Ugh, he was a disaster so mound the entire time. He was so bad. He threw like sixty pitches in like less than two innings. They told awful. me they they awful. told us this guy could be the next to ground, bro. That's what they said. I have that guy's tweet bookmarked. Yo, bro, I'm gonna pull that up once we're done recording, and I'm gonna tag you because that was some stupid shit. You only said that because the ground said, "Oh, I think this guy could be good," but whatever, whatever, bro. This guy stinks. He's, he's awful. He's, he's a Suda. He's, he's such not a good. Bum. He's a bum. I don't give a shit. His um, mom's on Twitter. She's a bum too. I don't care. She is a bum too. His brother's a bum too. They both, you know what I mean? It runs in the family. But anyways, Dominic Hamill, speaking of bums, um, he gave up four immediately after that. I know that the Mets were fighting back. You know, uh, they ended up tying the game to two. It went back and forth. Dominic Hamill comes in the game. He shits himself, gives up four immediately. Um, and yeah, I, I know that the offense continued to battle. I know that uh, uh, Vogelback and Pete both homered in this one. B had a had a pretty large home run um, to cut the lead to to one at eight nine. But uh, and Adam Montevito came in the game trying to, you know, I guess mop up duty for Josh Walker. And there was a squeeze play where he just he had the out in front of him. <laughs> And he just kind of yeah. sailed the ball a little yeah, that, bit that, too that high. It up. Ball, yeah, and you know we ended up losing this game eight to ten. So. I know you mentioned uh, Dominic Hamill. I think you meant Sandy Leon. I'm not sure if you. I don't know. Leon Leon hasn't been good. It, no, I know. Leon but, hasn't been that bad. And I don't think Hamill was Maybe in the game. The, yeah, the I, think, I think you got. To, I think you thinking about Hamill. He wasn't even there. It was it was Leon who got. Hamill wasn't in that game. Nah, it was Leon. Yeah. It was Leon. He had his first I'm bad like, uh, outing in a while, but hey, it's been good lately. I mean, we this goes back to McGill though. At the end of the day, you are giving us two innings. Yeah. What are we do? What are we doing? What are we doing here, bro? Come on, man. 
we just we just have it when we hit we get pitching and then when we pitch we don't get hitting it's it, just it's, nothing's coming together yeah it, it it's not it's just not at all connected it's it's it it's really bad man we lose a series in houston but um it's a series that i thought we if we would have won that third game we could go to philly you know what i'm saying and can yeah. probably Two out of three, hopefully, keep optimism alive and gain some ground on the wild card race. And um, that's what I, you know, was hoping for. Um, we'll head over to that series now. Game number one, <clears throat> we get to see our old boy Talon Walker. He's on the bump against uh, Kodai Senga, who, when we signed Kodai, he said he can't wish, he can't he can't wait to uh, pitch in Philadelphia, which he finally got to do. Um, you know, Walker kind of outpitched them a little bit. Uh, they both were very good for a few innings. They both were tremendous. I mean, the, the strike zone was was kind of generous to them both, but um, they both did their thing. Um, Brandon Nimmo, uh, he uh, gave us the only run of the game, unfortunately. Senga, though, you know, he, he had nobody help him. The first inning, the tone was set by a really unfortunate Brandon Nimmo error, dropping a lazy fly ball, um, and... Yeah. Uh, the Phillies get two early runs. Um, the Mets come back, you know, and Pete Alonso thinks he hits a moonshot home run. It literally just barely misses, but he's just watching the ball. He only makes it to second. He clearly could have made it to third base because Kyle Schwab was out there and the ball kind of just caromed off the wall. And, um, yeah, if Pete's not there watching his home run, like, you know, he's Barry Bonds or something, maybe he makes it to third. But, it, well, whatever, he can't talk about Pete. Um and Senga kind of like finally settled in, but unfortunately he finished with a line of five hits for four runs. Only two of them were earned, which were the first two runs of the game. Um, six six Ks. Uh, he kept us in the game. That's all you can ask for. Um, Lindor yeah. also made a blunder. Uh, that blunder kind of like pretty much sealed it at the end. He was literally going for a fly ball. And he was going in the alpha, but that's his ball. It's not Tommy Pham's ball. Um, you know, he's the gold glove guy. He has to make the play. Simple as. He has to make the play. And when that ball just fell, it was just like, Jesus Christ. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, the Mets lose this game 5-1. to one. The Mets are now closer to the worst record in the National League by six games than they are a playoff spot, which is seven and a half. It's very, very, very disappointing. It's been one of the worst Mets seasons in a long time because of the, you know, expectations. And they've have, not only have they fallen flat, they have fallen like through the fucking face of this earth, man. Um, with all that being yeah. said, in the start of the second inning, we got a trade. And um, I kid you not, before we dive into this trade, you know, tenfold, um, I thought we were being trolled. You know, I had to double check if the accounts were yeah. like one of those dummy accounts because, you know, I fall for those accounts all the time. Um, Eduardo Escobar traded mid-game for two pitching prospects from the Angels. Now, I that's why I thought I was being trolled. I'm like, the Angels? We trading with who? Yeah. The Angels? For what? Oh, oh, you hear <laughs> Angels and you're like, whoa, 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 refresh. Wait, what's happening? But it's not who you think, guys. Uh, Mets uh, trade Eduardo Escobar mid-game for two pitching prospects from the Los Angeles Angels. Two top 20 uh, arms in the Angels uh, minor league system. Uh, Coleman Crow, uh, Angels 19, uh, number 19 prospect who had a 1.88 ERA and a 0.63 whip. And, um, he's currently on the, on the IL. And we also, uh, brought in Landon Marco, if I'm saying that right. He's the number 20 prospect for the Los Angeles Angels. And he has a 4.8 ERA as a starter in double A. So two young pitchers that are ranked for an aspiring contract and, before we dive deep into this, we're going to get to game number two in Philadelphia. But it was crazy how they're interviewing Lindor mid-game, talking about, hey, did you hear about Escobar? He, he got traded about two seconds ago. And it's just like, what? Like, how could you? It's crazy. I mean, it's a business, yeah. but I don't know. Um, yeah. I was watching, and it was like, it was kind of hard to watch that. But he handled it well. He had a really good praise for Eduardo Escobar. And we're going to touch on Escobar in a minute. But um, that happened during the game, but we lost. Um, but we move on. And um, to the post Escobar era, uh, game number two in Philadelphia, Mets win four two. And guess who? Max. So it's funny we start off this episode with a Max victory. Max, you know, pitch really good, and we are ending um, Max pitching really good again. Six innings, seven hits, two runs, eight strikeouts in Philadelphia. We needed that. That's awesome. Um, bullpen. I, yeah, hey, listen, everybody out there, you know, I'm the Buccaneers guy. This is probably Buck's first game where he handled the bullpen. 
not first game, maybe like a few games, but it's been a while that Buck handled the bullpen really good. Um, bullpen had a clean, they were clean all around, zero runs. Um, and the way he handled it, who he put in and how he put him in, you know, he put in D-Rob at the eighth inning and then he went into the ninth, cleaned it. It was perfect. Kind of remind us of last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Marte, Nemo, Lindor. They all go two for four. Mets are three for six. The runners are scoring position versus Phillies one for eight. So, you know, that helps. And um, since having his baby girl, shout out to Lindor, shout out girl power, you know, uh, since he's having his baby girl, Lindor is slashing a 368 average with two home runs, seven RBIs and three stolen bases. Um, so shout out to Lindor, shout out to his wife, shout out to his family. Um, but yeah, what is your take about so far? Oh, we also have a game to play today, by the way. Uh, we are recording on the Sunday, yeah. as you guys know. Um, rubber game. So hopefully it goes better than the rubber game in Philly. I mean, excuse me, in Houston. What do you? Uh, what was your? I mean, you know, I knew you didn't get to you know keep your eyes glued to the screen like I did for this game. But what was your take on on both games, really? Yeah. Um. You know, game one was an epitome of what the season has been. Yeah, man. Um, it was a yeah. great presentation of what how things have been going, which mm-hmm. you know. Obviously, the former Met is going to shove against the Mets, and the shout Mets out, are going to make Taiwan, very... Man. Shout out Taiwan. Yeah, shout out Taiwan, man. He's 8-3 like three now. I know that he's... Yeah, I've always been a fan of Taiwan, so good for him. Um, yeah, no, this 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 game just perfectly summarizes what the Mets have gone through, which is just a lot of mental mistakes, Damn. a lot of mental errors um, combined with, you know, inconsistency, whether it be pitching I know that Senga had, you know, kind of a good game, even though his uh, defense didn't help him. But with the hitting as well, we didn't we didn't really get to muster up much against Taiwan. He only he only gave up three hits, and that was the three hits of the, of the entire game. Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, this that that was a great representation of what the Mets have gone through this year um, so far. But game two is also the opposite end of that. Usually, like we've been preaching, when they pitch they're able to win these games and that showed in game two mad max he looked great again um and yeah the the offense came with with very key and timely hitting and i think that game one and game two speak to how like up and down the season has been that's a really good observation because i agree i couldn't agree more i mean there's been so many games where we're just not we're not sharp we come to the game like mentally not there to start the game and you're in your rival stadium and you're dropping you're dropping fly balls and you're you're moon watching doubles like come on bro what are we doing bro uh, i guess a team that does that that yeah, team does that yeah i know that's not our brand of baseball that mm-hmm. team does that no, you get man. what i'm saying so it looks even worse it's like you know i know buck buck has his moments but this is definitely not a buck thing because buck Buck is one, one thing about Buck. Buck wants clean games. If we lose, we lose. But we don't want to look right. at that. We don't want to get embarrassed. So I I, right. I feel for him in that aspect, the frustration part. These guys have to take accountability. But the problem is that no one is holding account, the, accountability, the accountability towards them. And it's very, very frustrating. But we, re, we rebound. Um, I'm sure Buck probably gave him a lashing after that first game. And look, we showed up. And um, there was a moment yeah. in the game where Max, when he got pulled, and he's hyping up the dugout. And that might have been really, 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 really uh, a turning point, hopefully, because everyone was not – no one was sitting. Everyone was at the top of the dugout. Everyone is, like, giving him the same energy back. And everyone's like, they look kind of locked in. So, I mean, yeah. you know, we need that – you know, so shout-out to Max. Two really, really good back-to-back starts. Um, I have criticized him. Um, I have to eat my words a little bit. Um if he continues this way, I think we could be a little bit more optimistic because right now he's the ace of the staff right now. It's between him and Kawhi yeah. because we can't rely on Verlander. Yeah. We never know where we're going to get Ver- Verlander. And we have no idea who the, the you know, Cookie Carrasco, good, good Lord. You know, and then yeah. we, right now our fifth starter just got sent down to the, to the farm. We, we have no idea what's going to happen. I'm hearing Peterson's coming back up. Can you sing yeah. all your Hail Marys? Because we all know what's coming. So, um, you know, we're hearing rumbles that Jose Quintana today actually is doing a rehab start down at the farm. Um, so hopefully that goes well because we definitely need a guy like that. You know what I'm saying? We give his length in the, in the, you know, throughout games and just, just – we need to stop putting David Peterson and Tyler McGill in this rotation. Has to stop. Has to stop. Yeah. Guaranteed uh, losses. Guaranteed uh, L's. Guaranteed L's. 
something that I want to bring up with those two. Coming into this year, I think that we all thought as fans, we thought that those two were supposed to take the leap, especially um, I think Peterson because he had more starts than McGill last year. Those two were scheduled for, you know, a, a progression. And the fact that they have regressed this badly to the point where they're getting sent down is an, a humongous indictment on Jeremy Hefner. Oof, talk your shit, baby, bro. Uh, talk your shit. To be, able to, to, to be able to have these two young pitchers pitch as well as they, as they have in the past and as well as we know them to, to have, like, when they have good starts, they're very complementary pieces, mm-hmm. especially to the back end of the rotation. So coming into this year, both of them had a lot of expectations because these two, along with the two aces and Kodai, could help us, you know, get over the top. I know we had Quintana, but still, six-man rotation. We have the arms. And David Robinson has been piss poor. Mm-hmm. He hasn't been able to locate. McGill, same thing, hasn't been able to locate. They don't, they don't have put-away pitches. They, they have not progressed at all. And I don't think that that belongs on anybody's shoulders but them and Jeremy Hefner. Jeremy Hefner has, has significantly, um, you know, stunted those two guys' growth mm-hmm. um, because you're working with them. That There's nobody else's, you know, nobody else is working with them as much as you, bro. Mm-hmm. And the fact that these two guys were scheduled to have, you know, a progression and, and leaps this year and you let it fail on your watch. He deserves a lot of how bad, Yeah. Yeah, it, it just speaks to how I know that like, he spoke this week, which I mean, it's, which was very. I, I love that you brought that up. If you can, it's funny how this is the first time he spoke all year, right? Isn't that funny? For very first time, the very first time he speaks all year, and <clears throat> that you know, includes spring training has, too. You know what I'm saying? Like that, right, that's the crazy right. part. He has two aces, really one that hasn't been great. He has a pitcher that is new to all of this that mm-hmm. he's been trying to work with. Mm-hmm. And, and he's better at home than he is away. Mm-hmm. And then you got, which is expected. And then you got two guys who, is, who are slotted because of injuries into the rotation who just whenever they've had a chance, they haven't been able to capitalize on it. And no, that's nobody else's fault but the players involved and Jeremy Hefner. I mean... At the very least, uh, excuse me. At the very least, you have these two guys pitch well enough that they can be dangled as trade bait, but they're not even that at this point. Right, they're not even that they're good. Not, yeah, and it's so just, do that. Yeah. it's just, maybe he's spending so much of his time with Senga, or maybe he's just trying to figure out the mechanics with the old vets. I don't know, but I figured, like you know, with the vets, they yeah. could figure their own stuff out. But the problem is, is that so much was gone into Jeremy Hefner's stock with the Grom. You know what I'm saying? Making right. sure the Grom was right. back. And, that, you know, you got the high praise from the Grom with Jeremy Hefner. And then you saw way how he fixed Edwin Diaz. Everyone praised him for that. And it's like, <clears throat> you know, I, part of me is kind of upset that he's his guys are not doing well for him and they're failing him. But part of me also is like, listen. We were told, or the common thinking was that this is a very long staff going into the season. We have Verlander, we have Scherzer, we have Kodai Senga, we have Jose Quintana, who obviously we didn't know at the time was going to be out, whatever. We have Cookie, who me and you both said, all right, as the fifth starter, whatever, but he shouldn't still be here, whatever. And then you go into the David Robertson and McGill as your six, seven guys. So we're over here saying we got seven guys. Okay, cool. We have depth. But you know what the worst part about depth is when you have to use it. And then when you use it, it turns into this. You know, it's like having that fantasy football team with a dope bench. And then they they go off, right? You don't play the bench. But then when you guys get hurt and you have to play your bench, then they throw up duds. What was the point of the depth? It doesn't make any sense, right? It's it's like this weird myth. It's not depth. It's just just having names on your team that you think can provide you the stability. But when the stability is needed, it doesn't it doesn't come to fruition. And Unfortunately, that is the department that Jeremy Hefner works under. He's the head of that. And, you know, understandably so, the offense has declined. Yes, we have a new hitting coach. Understand. We probably should have not made the trade. I mean, the, the change. You know, maybe, you know, if we have, um, let's just face, Eric uh, Eric Chavez still as the hitting coach. Maybe we have an approach similar to last year. Fine. It is what it is. 
But we've had Jeremy Hefner for quite some time now, and we haven't seen a pitching staff collectively look this bad in quite a while. Definitely not under his watch. So he definitely yeah. has, you know, a lot of criticism landing at his doorstep, and rightfully so. But um, we did mention a trade earlier. Uh, we have to open up with how we acquired Eduardo Escobar and where we ended up with Eduardo, Eduardo Escobar. I just want to give everyone... The full Shea and Sons uh, experience of how we kind of absorbed how we were fans with Escobar. So when we acquired him, all right, shout out to Frank Diaz. Frank Diaz is jumping up and down. Oh, my God, we got Escobar. He's such a good hitter. 20 home runs, switch hitter. Ha, ha. You know, dad is jumping up and down. You were like, all right, cool. You were, all right, cool. Me, I was like, "Mm, I don't know about him as a starter. But I did like the, the right. fact that we got him because I kind of always liked him from afar. Yeah. Um, yeah. He gave us one month last year. Thankfully, that month was when we needed it the most because at the bare minimum, you know, we needed something from him. He gave us a cycle and he gave us a whole lot of fun moments as a teammate, as a leader. Shout out to him. It was actually really nice to see, you know, the TikTok moments. I mean, I know that's not what we want. Essentially, from a baseball player, we want production on the field, but he I'm proud re- of you. He, <laughs> he really, he really kind of lightened the mood a lot. I mean, it's one of those deals that it's like it needed to happen, but we're definitely going to miss him. I kind of already miss him, even though I've, you know, and especially last year, I gave him a lot of crap last year. This year, I haven't because clearly he's become a platoon guy. You know, we have Beatty and whatnot. So I, there's no reason to kind of criticize him, but he actually was playing pretty well. If anything, he kind of well. upped his draft stock. I mean, his draft stock, his trade, his trades value, because, you know, as a part-time player, he, he was really good. He was actually kind of hot. He was one of our hotter guys. Um, yep. And he wasn't playing every day. Maybe this is best for him. He's going to Anaheim. Uh, he gets to play with two of the best players right now in the game. Uh, so shout out to Escobar. I mean, there's nothing really bad you could say. Um, Escobar actually was one of the first people to like a Shea and Sons tweet when we had no following. So I'm going to yep. always remember that. Shout out to Escobar, De La Pica. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough pill as well. This one kind of... It, it was it was such a good trade, but it's also one of those that's like, damn, I'm gonna miss this dude. You know what I'm saying? And maybe he had the most fun yeah. with us. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But he definitely felt like that uncle. You know, for like for all the Latinos out there, he felt like that uncle that like yeah. when you see him at the holidays, he's just a nutcase and he makes things so much yeah. fun. And you know, it's hard to hate this dude. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. What, what about you? What is your? How'd you feel, man? Yeah, I was a little. I'm not gonna lie. I kind of fall on the sword where like I'm kind of sad by it a little bit yes um you know like if I wanted if I wanted a guy gone he wouldn't even be first second or third on that list of prioritizing a guy that I wanted off the team yeah um he would he would have been a nice bat to have as always uh he was very good this year in the limited time he was always a professional the way that he his demotion and Brady, uh, Beatty being called up, and you know, talking him through things. It was very nice to see. He was, he was, he was really always been a class guy. He was really good with the kids. Yeah, he was very good. With them. He was very good with them. I, I know that he's one of he's one of the closer guys to Lindor and and yeah. that whole you know the, the you know the Latin delegation and the team. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it, it was kind of rough to see. I hope that you know. Obviously, we saw it last night because the Angels absolutely killed the Rockies, and he was a was part a of that football he was game three, last he night in Colorado. Four. Yeah, yeah, he, he went three for four last night. So I'm I'm very happy for him. I got no ill will for him, even though that first year stunk. Um, he definitely saved the bacon in in September. So yeah, shout out to Esco. I'm glad, he, power, I'm, glad he, I'm glad he got a few hits last night. I think two or three, or oh, like you said or something. Like that. It was it was just nice to see. It was weird. I'm watching the Angels game. I'm like, I just want to watch an Angels game for Eduardo Escobar. I never thought I would see yeah, that. Yeah, I yeah. never. And it's funny. Otani did nothing. <laughs> like, if yeah. Otani didn't do a thing last night. And they put up, like, 30 or some runs. So, um, yeah. from from us to you, Eduardo Escobar, we're going to miss you, Hello. man. De lo mio, man. Shout out to you, brother. Um, but there is a baseball aspect to this move. So, the Mets... 
they got back some serious talent. Uh, okay, so I mentioned earlier Coleman Craw. Coleman Crow, I gotta get these names right. The number 19 prospect, and Landon Margot, Marco, I believe, the number 20 prospect. And uh, the Mets essentially purchased these two pitchers from the Angels by agreeing to pay all of Escobar's salary except for the major league minimum, which per league rule must be on the Los Angeles Anaheim Angels books. Escobar is making $9.5 million this season with a $9 million 2024 option that includes a 500 k kicker buyout. The Mets will not be on the hook for that option if the Angels choose to exercise it and i'm gonna quote billy epler after he made this trade quote steve makes stuff like this happen because he's willing to spend the money to get other prospects in the door from general manager billy epler as he continues quote i think this just shows there's a commitment to our long-term build end quote so it's interesting that quote we're gonna dive into the second half of the episode right now billy epler he says steve makes stuff like this happen Billy Epler is the general manager of the New York Mets. Steve Cohen is the owner of the New York Mets. There's something missing. We don't have a president of baseball operations. Now, I'm assuming the general manager helped make this deal, you know, become a, something that, you know, was, you know, linear in whatever they plan on doing in the future with Steve Cohen. I'm sure they probably, you know, aligned ideas and they, they have a vision to move forward. But right. Steve is Steve getting involved in trades. Now I understand Steve getting involved in call ups and and send downs maybe or uh, you know maybe kind of pushing the needle when it comes to going to get a big name. Like I understand that aspect of Steve Cohen, but Steve Cohen to make to be involved in a trade. For Eduardo Escobar to acquire two young pitchers. And by the way, I believe one of these pitchers was drafted by Billy Epler while he was out in Anaheim. So that makes a lot more sense. Um, or he drafted both. I would have to be fat checked on that. I'm not sure. But for Steve Cohen to be the first thing that comes out of Billy Epler's mouth, it makes you think, doesn't it, baby brother? What what is your initial thoughts on that? Yeah, it was kind of puzzling to hear because, you know, I I don't know. The way I look at Steve Cohen is like a guy who is, you know, very trustworthy of the guys that he has in place, you know, like a Billy Epler and Buck Walter. So to hear him being involved in this trade, it kind of made me think about the impending trade deadline and what direction this team is going to go in. Because if we're selling off an ancillary piece, which Escobar is, right, um, is is there more to come? Or it makes you think, like, right? You know, what what is the direction? I it made me think immediately there might be more to come because that trade came across as selling. You know, it came across as yeah. maybe we should start selling off pieces. And you know, you get the Twitter GMs immediately, you know, in a frenzy, like, oh my God, who else was his contract? And I, I ain't gonna lie, I joined in. But if Steve Cohen is gonna be a part of these deals while we have a GM but no president and Billy Epler's kind of acting president at the moment makes you wonder, right? No one else is really out here making deals. The only other deal that I think went down was, it's funny because Colorado's playing Anaheim. They made a deal for Mike Moustakas last night after that football game ended, but no one else is out here making deals. So the Mets kind of come across a little aggressive and they, you know, they sell off a very big clubhouse name who, you know, the contract was going to be, you know, clearly the contract wasn't going to be picked up. And, you know, Escobar wasn't going to be here next year. But they go get two young pitching but, prospects to help the, the farm out. And wonder, would that move be made if the Mets had a president of baseball operations along with Billy Epler and Steve Cohen? Now, before we get into he who should not be named, I just want to go over something with, you know, the landscape of baseball. A lot of people, they, you know... Baseball fans out there, they kind of know who who everyone knows who manages, you know, the Braves. Everyone knows who manages the Mets. Everyone knows who manages, you know, the the, the Dodgers and the Yankees and whatnot. But there's not a lot of people out there that understand who manages the general manager. I mean, excuse me, who manages the general manager, who is in charge of the general manager, you know, at each team. So that usually is the president of baseball operations. 
Now, a lot of times you have the president of baseball operations do the job of the president and as the GM. A lot of people don't know who these people are unless you're a fan of that team. Now, right. you know, we always talk about me and you specifically about stability. Billy Upler has been here since 2021 without a president of baseball ops. So he's pretty much just been answering to Steve Cohen. He's kind of been doing the job, but we know he's not the president. So let me ask you, you know, there's been a lot of dialogue about, about how this team is moving forward. And, you know, we don't think Billy Upper should be here based off, you know, the way this team is falling flat on their face. Now, we don't have a president and we have a GM who's an acting president. Do you think it's conducive for the Mets to fire this GM in order to start brand, you know, fresh, brand new and to move forward, you know, or keep the stability of Billy Upler along with adding a president of baseball operations? What's your thoughts on that? So. I'm thinking about it now. If this continues where we just seem like, um, you know, a team with no sense of direction and we're falling flat, flat on our face and, you know, we got the highest payroll in the league and then it just becomes a failed season and we sell off pieces. I think, you know, starting fresh and just admitting that the Billy Epler era was kind of a failure, even though, okay. you know, we did one in 101 games. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I think getting a president of baseball operations to get his guy, the guy that he wants in that general manager seat, and then or and then dictating whether or not he enjoys Buck Showalter enough to keep him around for one more season or two more. I mm -hmm. think that's very important. We see it in other sports, especially football. You know, guys like to get their guy. Yeah. You know, the, their guy. You know, in that seat because they're able to build that rapport and they chose them for a specific reason and because of the skill set that they bring to a team. So bringing in a guy like he who will be named um, <laughs> this episode, um, bringing in a guy like that, if he has a good, I'm not sure what the relationship is with him and Epler. If he has a good relationship with Epler and he sees him as a fit for what he's trying to do with this team, sure. Um, I, I I'm only with it because I, I don't like Billy Epler, but if the this quote unquote savior is going to save the Mets and he's going to be the president of baseball operations and he has past success and he believes in Billy Epler and he's able to use Billy Epler in order to help build this team and he sees something in that, then I'll rock with the vision. But I'll be very cautious and hesitant with I agree. where we go. From. Well, the rumor is, is that they were uh, college roommates. That's a rumor. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we'll get into that in a moment. What I want to do is just present to the, the people out there who will be watching, who will be uh, tuning in. But if you're on YouTube, shout out to everybody on YouTube. Um, I just want to give you a quick glance at um, the landscape of baseball with president of baseball operations and the GM. Now, like I mentioned earlier, there are GMs who do the job of both positions, which is interesting. So the president pretty much is also the GM. There's other organizations that actually have a president along with their GM. So it, 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 it's very interesting. I have every single team here. I'm going to put it up. Um, and it's interesting to get the timeline of these events. So I'll start with the NL East. I'll, I'll run through this really quickly. Since 2017, the Braves have had Alex Anthopoulos as the GM. I don't know how long he's been the president, but clearly they have one guy making pretty much calling all the shots. So the stability has been there for about six, seven years. So there you go. It was one of the best organizations in baseball. They have one guy doing both things. Uh, Philly, since 2020, um, they've had GM Sam Fold. Um, and president of baseball operations, Dave, David Dombrowski. We all know how David Dombrowski moves. He's a wild boy. Um, so they've had, you know, that combo for a few years now. Uh, Marlins, uh, the only team in baseball with two females at the helm with Caroline O'Connor as the president and GM Kim and N N G. if I'm not saying that, I apologize if I'm incorrectly saying that. Uh, I believe she took over for uh Derek Jeter. Jeter. Uh, yeah, I believe yeah. that's correct. Uh, Nationals, uh Mike Rizzo does a job of both president and GM. We're going to head to the Central. Nick Crawl is uh the president and GM of the Red Hot Sizzling uh Cincinnati Reds, who's everyone's, you know, team this year apparently over the past week. Um so they've had the same guy do the job since 2018. 
who went over to the Pittsburgh Pirates since 2019. The GM has been Ben Sherrington, and they've had the president of baseball operations as Travis Williams. Uh, we've seen an improvement for the Pirates this year, so you know they're getting they're pretty much on the same wavelength. Uh, now, interesting, the Brewers since 2020, the GM has been Matt Arnold. And now, recently, the president of baseball operation is Rick Sleisinger, and it was previously a man who we will name in a moment. Um, Cubs, Carter Hawkins is the GM since 2021. President of baseball operations is Jed Hoyer. Cardinals, since 2017, Mike Gersh, and the president of baseball operations is John Moliak. I've heard a lot of people complain about those two since 2017, so it makes you wonder, hey, since 2017... You know, this combination hasn't been doing well. They probably want change. So, you know, you can kind of see there's a lot of newer people in the job. And there's a lot of people who've been in the job. And it's curious to see the landscape of where each team. You know, like there was a few years the Cardinals were doing well. And I'm hearing, you know, yeah. just based off this season, they want both of them gone. So, you know, if you look at it at the totality, did those guys do their job? Or just as one season is good enough to fire them? Depends on, you know, the fan you ask. Dodgers. They actually, a lot of people don't even know this. They got a new GM, Brandon Gomez, um, president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman. Since 2022, they've had Brandon Gomez. So he's just got into the job. So clearly the GM prior has done a really good job with this organization. The Dodgers are always in it. Uh, Padres since 2014, AJ Preller. We all know about AJ Preller. Um, he pretty much does a job for both uh, president and GM. Giants since 2020, they've had Pete Petulia and president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi. So, you know, relatively new group together for a few years. Diamondbacks, since 2016, their GM has been Mike Hazen and president of baseball operation Derek Hall. So we all see the Diamondbacks this year. They're looking really good, but they've had stability now for quite a while, since 2016. So maybe, you know, being patient, smaller market, but, hey, it's working out. Rockies, uh... Got a new GM, Bill Schmidt, and president of baseball operations is Gregory Fiesel. Moving on, I'm going to run through the American League real quick. Now, this one is interesting. Shout out to uh, all my Yankee fans out there. Since two, since excuse me, not two, since 1998, the longest tenured general manager in baseball, Brian Cashman, he's been at the helm for the Yankees with president of baseball operation Randy Levine. Now, that's an interesting one. The Yankee fans out there every year want Brian Cashman out of the job, but since you know 1998. <laughs> The Yankees, I don't think they've ever missed the playoffs. They've had, they even have a ring. Uh -huh. So, depends who you ask, you know. Depends who you ask. Um, such a funny name. Brian Cashman. <laughs> Brian Cashman. Blue Jays, since 2015, Ross Atkins has been the GM, and president of baseball operation is Mark Shapiro. Rays, now a lot of people love what the Rays are doing, but check this out. The GM is Peter Bendix, since 2021, and the president of baseball operation is Eric Neander. Now, that's a guy the Mets were interested in bringing on, and they did not land him. Just putting it out there. Just a fun fact, Eric, ne Eric Neander, I'm saying that right, he actually started off with the Tampa Bay Rays as an intern, worked himself all the way up as president he was with the organization since 2007. So shout out to Eric Neander. And look, every year, it seems like the Rays are getting it right. So they're doing some out there. Orioles, since 2018, Mike Elias has done the job of GM and president of baseball operations. Moving on to the Red Sox. Since 2019, the GM has been Brian O'Hallahan. I'm saying that wrong. And the president of baseball operations is Heim Bloom, another name that people are very critical about. The Guardians, since 2022, Mike Chernoff has been the GM. President of Baseball Operation has also been Mike Chernoff. Twins, since 2016, Thad Levine, the GM. President of Baseball Operations, Derek Falve. White Sox, since 2012, Rick Hahn has been the GM. And the President of Baseball Operations has been Ken Williams. Tigers, since 2022, Scott Harris done the job of both GM and President of Baseball Operations. Royals, since 2021, J.J. Piccolo has done the job of both GM and President of Baseball Operations. Oakland A's, um, uh, this one sucks. Since 2015, David Frost has done the, G the job of GM and President of Baseball Operations with, with probably no hope. That man, I, I would love to talk to that man for 10 minutes because I'm sure the owner probably gives him nothing to work with. Angels. Since 2022, Perry um, Menasian has done the job of GM and president of baseball operations. 
Chris Young has also been the GM and president of baseball operations for the Texas Rangers, who's really hot this year since 2020. So Chris Young is doing a great job down there. Mariners since 2022. Justin Hollander and president of baseball operations Jerry DePoto has uh, been at the helm as president of baseball operations. And last but not least, since 2023, the general manager of the Houston Nationals has been Dana Brown. And just like the New York Mets, they do not have a president of baseball operations. Their GM is acting president. So I know I ran through that, probably bored you all, but I'm just putting it out there. Guys do, know, do not know the GM. We talked about this, Keyshawn. People don't know who the other team's GM and president of baseball operations are. We don't know these guys. They move in the shadows. I just named everybody for all the teams. And I gave you the timeline of when they've been at the job. Mentioned Diamondbacks. They've had a project. They've worked towards it. Mentioned Cardinals. They've had a project and have failed with it. You look, you got the Marlins. They looking really good with two females at the helm. Shout out to the Marlins. You know what I'm saying? Astros, they don't even have a president of baseball operations. They got the same situation we have with Dana Brown and um, Billy Epler. You know, and then you look at just like a mess in Oakland, you know, just, so what is your take? I know that's a lot of info for everybody out there. You could Google those names. You could do what you got to do. Shout out to people who root for those teams. I don't know how you feel about, you know, your front office, but that's the front office for every MLB team out there. Um, and as you, as we, I just, just stated the Mets and the Astros are the only team right now that I kind of did the, the information I gathered with the GM as acting president. So, that leaves an opening for two jobs in Major League Baseball. President of Baseball Operations for the New York Mets and the Houston Astros. What's your take on all that? So, yeah, baseball is very weird, right? Like, we know all the managers' names, or at least have an idea of who's managing each team. But the guys who, you know, dictate a lot of what sometimes, you know, in some some of these cases, the man, the general manager is dictating what the manager is doing. Yep. You know, in baseball, uh, a lot of teams have followed the philosophy of using analytics as the end all be all for how they manage their teams. And a manager is just there to be the day to day guy, you know, reading off of a spreadsheet who should be in the lineup, what placement they should be in the lineup. You know who they have success against who they don't have success against and all that is stems from a general manager um so it's very it's very weird that because these general managers have so much pull with some of these organizations that we don't even know who they are and they're making all these key decisions you know like we know brian cashman but that's really because he's been there since longer than i've been on this earth so <laughs> i mean like that it's not really that known in in other sports the nba the, the the nfl we know these guys names like these guys these these gms are, are poster boys for a lot of the stuff that goes on with these organizations and in, in other sports so it's just very 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 um weird to see that and to you know to know that because a lot of baseball now is just run through a front office. I know that our father likes to bring it up a whole lot, how much analytics means to the game. And we're seeing it right here. Like a lot of these names are new names. Yeah. I'm looking at, you know, and the ones with tenure, there's been success, you know, mm -hmm. like I know that the, the Dodgers just hired a GM, but Andrew Friedman won with them. You know, you look at uh, uh, the Astros. I know that they're trying to replace They've been trying to replace the guys that they had last year, so they don't really count, but they had a long-tenured crew, too. Um, the Nationals, Mike Rizzo. Mike Rizzo's been there since uh, for a long time. You know, so could it be that, you know, with tenure comes success? I'm not sure. I think it's more so the people that you have at the home that, you know, more so dictate that. But if you're going to keep a guy like Billy Epler around for a long time, um, I just don't think that he can and do this by himself. I agree. I think he's shown that. I think he's shown that a lot this year and last year that he kind of needs a guiding hand. I agree. With some of the stuff that he's been dealing with. Um, I know that I, I don't like him and, and I like <laughs> to, you know, show him at every chance that I get, but maybe a guy like that is better served with somebody watching over him and dictating things that, you know, that, that can be done for the team to improve it. Absolutely. Uh, somebody has to be the Pippin. 
Somebody got to be, right. you know, the Jordan. Simple boys, you know what I'm saying? And now leading up to the name that we've been trying to hold back, um, that name might be David Stearns, formerly of the Milwaukee Brewers. Now, me and my brother have been told by many people that David Stearns is going to be the next president of baseball operations for the New York Mets. Cool. I'm with it. I don't know a lot about David Stern. So we're all going to take a little, you know, lap right now on David Stern so we can all be in the same boat. Because right now, I have a lot of information here to share with you guys, and we're going to just break it down. Now, you know, David Stearns is not, you know, it's not going to, like, win a ring tomorrow. Let's just put it out there. This guy... We're not going to put all the pressure on this one guy. I know a lot of Met fans want this guy, but let's just put it out there. David Stearns, under Steve Cohen, with money, looks very appealing. Has Billy Epler as his pippin. I don't know if he's going to fire him. Has Buck Showalter currently as his manager. We don't know if he's going to fire him. Uh, what I do know is Buck Showalter has another year on his deal. So, you know, he might give these guys another year. Just putting it out there. It's possible. So let's just make believe David Stearns is a New York Met. Let's do a little bit of a history lesson. David Stearns. Ooh, all right, David Stearns, he joined MLB Central Office in 2018 where he worked and negotiated for MLB's collective bargaining agreement. So he has some say in that. He has some history with that. Um, he was there for 13 months. You know, he worked with salary arbitration, you know, offices and did a whole lot for baseball in that regard. Uh, he's worked with the Cleveland Indians. He's been a uh, co-director of baseball operations there. Um, he will focus on player contracts and data analysis, strategy, uh, he didn't work on player acquisitions, though. He was there just doing, you know, pretty much analytic stuff and working on the contracts and stuff. Now, this is where it gets interesting, guys. In 2012, the Houston Astros, who had lost over 100 games in both the past two seasons, hired Stearns as an assistant GM. Uh, you know, he probably got his feet wet really there. Probably got, the you know, the feel of the job there. Um, uh, he was only the assistant with the Astros, so... You know, he was he wasn't calling the shots, but he has history with the Astros. So just putting right, it out there, right. you know, he was he was kind of on that ladder ascending as a as a front office executive in whatever facet you want to consider him as. Um, but his big break came in 2015, where he became the general manager of the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, he succeeded Doug Melvin. Um, and uh, he, at the time, he became the youngest general manager in Major League Baseball. Um, which is pretty impressive. I mean, that alone can give you a lot of like optimism. Um, he, he right. seems to know what he's doing. He seems well respected in baseball. Um, he was actually younger than Ryan Braun at the time. So that's interesting. Um, he actually brought on Craig Council, who's still with the Milwaukee Brewers as manager. Fun fact, Craig Council is out of his contract this season. So keep that in mind, folks. Also keep in mind that the fact that he's worked with Houston in the past. So I know a lot of people think it's a slam dunk for him to get here. Let's hope and pray that is the case because we definitely need a president of baseball operations. Um, now, his time in Milwaukee. Now, uh, me and my brother have said this many times. We don't want to be, we don't want to play like the Milwaukee Brewers. This is no disrespect. We don't want to be the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Brewers have actually been pretty pretty a pretty decently ran organization when you look at like maybe the past four or five years um but they 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 offload a lot of guys they don't have the payroll we have yeah. so sterns with our payroll can be quite appealing um you know i'll look into some of the moves he made um one of the big moves he made you can look at it now hindsight is always 2020 he brought in yelich to milwaukee um he signed lorenzo kane who was pretty good for them uh on the same day in 2018 you know the mets are known for doing things on the same day where we did with billy epler a few years back um you know take that as you you know however you want that was probably one of the bigger moves he did make he also last year tr well last year apparently the story is he wasn't really hands-on they kind of kept him away because they all know he's gonna leave eventually so last year you know the brewers did trade josh Hader. um i mean take that as you want that's a big contract coming to the team that they probably couldn't afford um you know in the past they've also acquired other players and nothing major but nothing that like you know like he in 2021 they signed jackie bradley jr to 24 million dollars i mean this doesn't really determine what how you feel about 
David Stearns, like he, he, he signed Jonathan Scope, you know, from Baltimore in 2018, uh, one of the more notable moves, they say, you know, he waved Scooter Jeanette. He was pretty criticized for that. I mean, there's not a lot of major groundbreaking moves in the David Stearns era as, you know, general manager for the Milwaukee Brewers. But the Milwaukee Brewers were a respectable, you know, team to go against. You know, they had Corbin Burns through the system. You know, Freddie Peralta, he did extend him. Freddie Peralta's a pretty decent pitcher for them. So, you know, take it for how you want. I mean... One thing about the Brewers is that they have pitching. So if that's what David Stearns is really critical on is pitching, that bodes well for the New York Mets. That's a quick deep dive in David Stearns. Um, so just the rumors are is that he's going to be a New York Mets president of baseball operations. He's buddy-buddy with Billy Epler. Um, but there is an opening in Houston. We don't know if he's going to be the president down there. He's going to be the president up here. And apparently the Milwaukee Brewers kept him at home all last year because they know he's going to leave something to do with his contract. You know, you hear a whole bunch of stories, but this is the guy who can quote unquote stabilize the franchise and build the farm up. And then we take Cohen's money and we take it and we go lift off. Right. You, 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 you convince me on why this is probably the best thing that we can hope and pray for this off season, because not only do we need talent, we need we need organization in the front office. So I, much like you coming into this year, I didn't know much about David Stearns, but because we are bad, he has turned into like the saving grace for some people. <laughs> um, like people are people are dying for this man to become a man. And I I don't know, I don't get it. But I'll speak to the the those 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 prophets, those David Stern prof, uh, the Stern's prophet. Um, when you look at the Brewers, they have pitching. They've they've been able to create a system with guys where you know they they kind of maximize what they get out of guys. Um, you look at Rowdy Telez. Telez has been very very good for them um, throughout his tenure there. Very good. Andrew player, McCutcheon man. was a, Andrew McCutcheon was a good player for them last year. Um, you know. Uh, I think they had uh, Willie Adamas. He, he's been a solid player for them was, as well. That was actually a big move he made, trading for Willie, you know, getting him from Tampa. Yeah, well, that was actually a good move. Right. Well, Willie is a, it was a big guy for them. Uh, they had Omar Nevarez, uh, Kurt Met. You know, so there's been guys that they have brought in that they've been able to maximize, you know, the, the production from those guys. And they've been playing with house money because they don't have much money, money to spend. Yeah. So. The the um the idea is is that if he's able to do that with a team that can't really spend that much money to a team that can, the notion is is that he is the guy he's the right guy for the job because he'll have all sorts of tools at his disposal to create the team that he sees fit. Um, people criticize the Christian Yelich trade. Looking back on it, the the yellow trade didn't really produce much for um, the Marlins, and then also you gotta look at those first two years from Yelich. He almost won back to back MVPs. I mean, he was that's probably he was great. his biggest he, move. I mean, right? It's, it's, I, I would say that I would say that that move worked out because the guy turned into an MVP on their watch. You know, it yeah, wasn't I mean, like this contract sucks now, but. Like you, you're you're right. I mean, if you could get two years, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I know people would ju- criticize it, but nobody saw that, and it happened under there. Nobody watch. saw that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, Yelich. If you want to think about Yelich before he ended up there, he was a slap hitter, three hundred hitter. It was he didn't really hit for power. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he he wasn't really a timely hitter um, that they wanted down uh, in Miami. But then he went to the Brewers and he became an all around hitter and a power threat, a big power threat. He won MVP. He nearly won it a second time. Yep. Um, I know that that contract looks fugazi now and he's not really the, the player he once was. I know that there's you, some injuries you, you, there. You as give well. that contract out to an MVP caliber yep. player. Yes. You don't like, you, yes. you, you can't Every, be bad at do that. that. 10 out of 10. I mean, do the that Brewers, 10 out of 10 times. Yeah, we can't kill the. Look, I mean, look. The Brewers' last best player was like what CC or Ryan Brown, Brian Brown, and like good lord, how long yeah. has that been? You know, and before that, Prince Fielder. I mean, yeah, Prince Fielder. Like they kind of go through these long stretches with these guys, and then they don't win. 
So like you got a guy right. with MVP. If David Stearns is controlling the organization, he's like, yeah, I gotta pay this guy. I just traded for him. I gotta give him the money. I get it. I understand. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I get it. I, at all times, plus you traded for him. You just, yeah. you traded for like so, and he won MVP on your watch. So you look like a genius. Yes. So sir. why not reward the guy and give him a long term deal? And it just hasn't worked out. I'm but sure you every do Brewers that deal fan wanted that to happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. assuming, right? You know? Yeah. Um, Before we wrap it up, I want to present to you a few scenarios because this is what's going to happen when David Stearns gets a job, right? This is what we assume is going to happen. Number one, we got to pay Alonzo because if you don't pay him, you got to trade him. That's the, that's the most glaring situation, my opinion. If you come into the job, that is number one. You have to figure out how much you're going to pay him, how much he's going to agree to, and, you know, the length of that deal. It's not the money for me. It's the length. That's my thing. With contracts, I'm big on length. You know, if it's a short-term deal, then I change my opinion. Then it becomes more of a money thing. You know, like I've been very critical of, like, the Marte contract. It's a shorter contract, but it's crazy. It's like $39 million for two more years. It's crazy. But, you know, yeah. that's neither here nor there. So the Pete Alonso contract is number one. Number two, does he keep Billy and does he keep Buck? Now, Craig Council is going to be a free agent. I don't know if he's the manager that Steve Cohen wants. I'm going to tell you right now, I'd rather Buck. And I hate Buck. I'd rather Buck than Craig Council. The Craig Council does nothing for me. Not in New York. There's no way. I could be wrong and I will, I will hold my hands up to the heavens. But again, like you mentioned, does he bring his own guys? We don't know. So it's Pete Alonso's contract. And is, does he retain Billy Epler, who quote-unquote is his friend? And does he retain the 2022 manager of the year, Buck Schulter? And the last question. Now, this one is the one that we all hope and pray, you know, comes to fruition. Is that can he make us a perennial contender year in and year out? We don't know. Because now this is a situation where, where he's, he's, he's given all the money in the world to work with. And a lot of people said that they didn't want to work for Cohen because of the pressure of getting all that money and not delivering. He didn't have that sort of money in, you know, in he, even his time in Houston. He damn sure didn't have that money in Cleveland, and he damn sure didn't have that money in Milwaukee. So now this could be so appealing for a guy like that. You know, all you right. hear is, oh, they don't know if they could work for Cohen. No one wanted the job. No one wanted the job. Somebody's going to take the job, guys. So now he gets the job. He gets a blank check. You got to develop the farm and you got to pay guys and you got to bring in the right pieces. And then we got to see what's going to happen. Now, we can't answer that now. But those are the three scenarios that I think you and me are going to keep a close eye on when it comes to David Stearns. So, I don't know. What Do yeah. you agree, do you agree with that? No, I, I definitely agree with that. I would say that more than anything, paying Alonzo falls a little bit lower on the totem pole just for me because I think that you kind of have to figure out where you're going to go in this direction. If you hire somebody new, you're, you're putting all, if you're Steve Cohen, you're putting all of your, not hope, because that's a little bit too dramatic, but all your, all your, I guess, I guess all your hope throughout that tenure for this guy to be the guy. And if he's going to make decisions on who's the general manager and the manager for an entire tenure, whether it be four years, whether it be three years, five years, um, that's pretty important to me. But re-signing a guy like Pete Alonso, um, building out the farm, adding guys, you know, getting guys out of here, contracts, it's going to be very interesting to see. We can't answer it right now. But if this guy's the real deal and he's been, he's going to be given, uh, you know, a blank check, you know, to just sign anybody and, and do whatever he wants, how he sees fit, then I think that, you know, it's a it's a very important move for how we're gonna see this team move forward for the next, you know, uh, three four years. I have a conspiracy theory. Now, before I wrap up with my conspiracy theory, is that the trade that happened yesterday, like you know, that that trade, they Billy Upler said, I, I you know, Steve's future and his vision kind of came into play with that. I don't know. Maybe maybe they were on a three way on a three way call. Who knows? Because Billy Apple doesn't make a lot of good moves. That was a good move for getting what you got for Escobar. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if that was all Billy Epler, and I damn sure don't think that's Steve Cohen. 
there's no way Steve Cohen's over here looking at the Angels, you know, farm system. Steve Cohen has beef with Artie Moreno. So who's really, you know what I'm saying? I'm I'm wondering if my man is moving in the shadows. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm just I'm just curious because there, there's there's got to be something to it. There's a lot of guys who are up with the roster who shouldn't be here. Maybe they're working their way to get traded off. You know, maybe that's why some of the kids aren't up. Who knows? We don't know. These are all scenarios we got to kind of put into play. I wouldn't be put it past them if Stearns is somewhere out there kind of giving them a leg up on certain things. So who knows? Um, the only thing I want to say about the Pete Alonso thing is that if he does, you know, change manager and GM, the Alonso deal kind of falls on their lap. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of one of those situations where it's like that money could have gone to Otani. Now, I'm not saying we're getting Otani. I'm not doing all of that. But that's this is just a big chunk of money going to a first baseman where we don't know if it's going to go anywhere else. So I feel like that, in terms of baseball moves, you know what I'm saying, that will probably be number one for him. I'm sure, like, front office moves, like you said, it'd definitely be keeping Billy and keeping Buck. Um, you know, I would have put it past him if he keeps Billy and keeps Buck one whole year. Buck's contract ends next, at the end of next year. And then Billy... Probably ends up being one of those, you know, front office people that we don't ever see again. You know what I'm saying? We don't ever hear from him right. again. And then he's yeah. only there just to, like, make the occasional uh, interview and and speak on certain things about, you know, shit in the farm. And, and, you know, David Stearns is moving continuously in the shadow. And he gets to do whatever he wants to do with the organization. And Cohen gives him the money. So, but, yeah, this is the David uh, Stearns episode. Um Kind of kind of bizarre because we're talking about a lot of unknowns and um, we could only yep. give you the facts. Um, but we all saw when I broke down all the, the, the GMs and president of baseball operations, there's quite a few guys who do both jobs and there's quite a few guys who don't and women. And there's quite a few organizations that have had the tenure to show success and there's quite a few people that have had the tenure and have showed failure. Like I mentioned, you talk to a Yankee fan, they'll tell you that combination of Randy Levine and Brian Cashman has been a failure in their aspect, the way they view, you know, what a successful season is. You know, it's, if you look at the Cleveland Indians, they they probably knocked it out the park because they don't have any money. So, um, you know, it depends. Every team is very different. Um, but that being said, let's go to your bozo and amazing of the week, and then we wrap it up. So who's your bozo of the week, right. baby, brother? My bozo of the week, this was kind of hard because I'm trying to think about, you know, anybody that particularly stands out as a bozo of the week. I know okay. that as a collective, we just haven't been good. Yeah. Um, so I can't I can't give it a JV because he only started one game Fair. this week. I'm going to give it to Brandon Nimmo. Oh, wow. You caught me with a curve with that one, but that is a great choice. It's a great choice. Um, Better than mine. I'm going to give it. Yeah, I'm going to give it to Brandon Nemo because I understand. I completely get it. There are going to be people that are going to be angry with this because he has answered for his mistakes when he has the mistakes. But the mistakes are so glaring yeah. when he has them. I agree. Because it's just simple mental errors <laughs> that we don't normally see from the guy. Yeah, yeah. So it's like whether it's base running, whether it's on the field, you know, you're talking about this guy possibly winning a gold glove. Old Glovers don't do that in the outfield. They just yep. don't. They don't make the play against the I Yankees agree. last week. They don't make that play against the Phillies the other day. Yeah. They 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 catch the ball. They call off their guys. They make sure that you know they are heard. They patrol center field. And mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Um, it just I I understand that he hits home runs after he makes these mistakes, and or he'll hit a triple, or he'll he'll have a very nice walk to first base after taking four pitches. But come on, bro. You're one of the leaders of the team. You got to be hold, better. You got to hold him accountable. Um, you got to hold him accountable. So him he is accountable. my bozo. It's a great pick. It's better than mine. I was going to go to Adam Adovino. He's been giving me way too many headaches this week. A good one. Come on, good Adam. One. Uh, Otto, we need, we need more, bro. This is not what we signed up for, homie. Please. We need you to give, you know, the manager a little bit of a sense of, you know, relaxation. Not fucking yeah. anxiety, bro. Please cut the yeah. bullshit. Even in your innings where you get out of it, they're fucking dreadful. You're giving people way yeah. too much fucking anxiety. Cut the shit, please, bro. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree with that. No, yeah, I agree with yours too. If anything, yours is better. So Nemo, Adovino, uh, 
you know, bozos of the week. My amazing of the week. I'm going to go with Francisco Lindor. He's had a really nice week. Really good bounce back week. He's, uh, since the baby, he's been really good, what we mentioned earlier. Uh, shout out Frankie Lindor. Um, this is what you want from a guy that, quote unquote, one of your better players. Uh, you can't yeah. criticize him this week. He's been, he's entered the bell. He's been there for us. And uh, long may it continue. You know, apparently July is his hottest month, you know, based off the baseball card. And hopefully that actually is what happens. We get the, the hottest Lindor we've ever gotten. Yeah, um, Lindor has been great. I think he's like one of the finalists for All Star Game. Hopefully he makes it because I, I don't know. That voting system is a sham. And he is the best. Shortstop, I don't care what you say in baseball. I understand that it's a bad position now, and a lot of guys haven't been performing, but he has been. I know averages, whatever, we could get into that. It doesn't matter for another day. Um, amazing of the week. I think you could have selected, like, at least three people, even though we only won two games this week. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think it was between Lindor, um, Vogelback, and Scherzer, and I'm going to pick Scherzer. Yeah, I have a um, feeling you were going to go with him. Fair enough. Scherzer has been great um, this week. Last week, we we tore him apart during the Bozo yeah, of the Week segment. Yeah, we, we definitely, definitely did. tore him apart. Maybe he watches. So, Who knows? Maybe maybe they watch. Maybe he hate watch. Maybe he was mad while he watched. Don't care. But he answered the bell this week. Um, definitely. Only gave up three, three arm runs in what? Uh, I think it was like almost 15 innings. Um, so Huge. he's been pitching as well. Yeah, he's been pitching as well as you could ask for especially for ace of his caliber, and especially since, you know, the past two starts of the, uh, well, before last week haven't been great. You know, giving up six arm runs in less than four innings, not great. So um, yeah. he's been very good this week, and I think it's well-deserved. Yeah, no, shout-out to Max. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those ruts. Maybe we get out of it. Um, let's just hope we get to 500 very soon. Uh, we had an opportunity to do that based off last week's episode, but we did not. We continue going down a negative, negative route. It's going to get to a point where, you know, the people who were preaching in April season's over, they might be right. I hope they're not, but it is what it yeah. is. But, hey, look, that wraps up the David Stearns episode, episode number 12. Shout out to our people at Shea and Sons. Um, excuse me, Shea Hello Media, because we are Shea and Shea Sons. <laughs> Shout out to YouTube. <laughs> Shout out to Apple. Shout out to the people at Spotify. Shout out to everybody. Listen, last week we got a really good positive feedback from our episode. Um, what we were talking about trades that can help the team and um, yeah we're trying to just you know give you guys different aspects of how to think about the New York Mets as we go through probably one of the worst ruts we've gone through since 2021 so keep the faith yeah. keep your chin up and um, you know this is what it is to be a fan you got to be there during the negatives and you got to be there during positives because you know you know we're not casuals we we love the team we were born and bred into it and this is the reason why we're here so if we can provide you any happiness that is our job and with that being said shout out to the new york mets shout out to david stearns wherever you at hope you hear us and um you know what i'm saying that's a wrap baby let's fucking go mets thanks for checking out the shade of sun podcast make sure to follow us on all social media platforms and stay tuned for the next episode <laughs>